Good afternoon, and we welcome you to The Real Word. I'm your host, Brother Ricard G. Noel. I'm here with my co-host. This is your boy, Sander Kamal. What's good, family? And we're here with a special guest. Gerard Fanor, Jr. And we thank you for joining us today. This is our 16th episode. We thank everybody that's been supporting, everybody that's been watching. We thank you all for supporting us and helping us to stay consistent. We're still here because of you. Everything that we do is because of you. And we just hope that you guys keep watching and keep listening to the real word. This brother can't cook. So for anybody who have any questions in regards to um, how to make different recipes, how to make different type of food, you guys can definitely ask through live stream. If you have any questions you guys want to ask, you can ask. But uh, Brother Fenor, um, tell the people about yourself, my brother. Well, um, my name is Gerard. I've been cooking for years. Um, I uh, graduated from the CIA in 09. Um, and, uh, What's the CIA? Oh, it's uh, the, the CIA is also government branch. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's the Culinary Institute of America. It's uh, one of the premier food colleges in this country. It's located in Hyde Park, um, New York. Um, and I, I got my culinary training there, but I started cooking at home, um, you know, watching my mom and my grandmother. And, um, you know, I, I love cooking for people and making people happy, so I just uh, pursued it as a career. Um, I recently just uh, got a new position as a GM at Carlos Bakery in um, Times Square, New York. Mm. Um, and um, right now I'm still working at Pepperidge Farms. I work with the um, Snacks Innovation Team and uh, we work on uh, various uh, goldfish crackers and try to um, make them better. Mm. Ambitious, ambitious. I wanted to basically ask, um, what made you pursue cooking? as a profession? Um, I mean, just cooking for people. I, growing up, I would cook for my friends and uh, after school, and, uh, and I, I would cook for my family because my parents were always working um, long hours, so um, you know, I had my siblings, so I would cook for them. And uh, the joy people get from eating good food, I mean, you know, that, that made it like something I really want to do and is make people happy. So basically, you know, you, you prepare a very good meal. Um, everyone sit around and eat and it brings a lot of joy to them. So, you know, I just want to bring joy to people with my food. I can testify of your work. My man makes a, 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 a on point chicken fettuccine Alfredo. So this guy is on point with his food and everything like that. Definitely, definitely, definitely. Um, I also wanted to ask you as well, um, so how did you know that it was your calling in regards to, to going to becoming a chef? Well, um, I, I always had a job as a cook, so you know, while I was trying to try different things, I went to school for art, was trying to go to school for different things, I always, my job was always cooking in the kitchen and you know, eventually I put one and two together and then um, decided to go to school for cooking and um, it, it worked out well for me and um, you know I had uh, a lot of opportunities and I got to travel just meeting a lot of different people at the Culinary Institute of America. I visited their states and their homes and uh, the passion was there. People go to that school because their whole family love food and cooking for people so I got to enjoy traveling and meeting a lot of different people just through food. Mm, amazing. What's one of your favorite dishes to cook? For myself, one of my favorite dishes is um, some honey hot wings. And uh, basically I would uh, take uh, Frank's Red hot sauce and just um, reduce it. I put that thing on everything. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, just put some honey in it and just let it cook down. And then um, once it's all done, I fry the wings or I could bake them. And then I just toss it in the sauce, very simple, and um, that's my favorite food to eat. That's fried, boiled, or baked? Um, you could either fry it or you could bake it. Which one do you think is better, fried or baked? Um, if you really want it crispy, frying is where to go. But if you want to be a little bit healthier, baking is where to go. Okay. So there is a big difference whether you fry or bake your food, right? You're saying that if you want to be more healthy, it's better if you bake it versus fry it? Yeah, because in, in frying, the frying application, you got to use fat. 
the bacon, you don't have to add additional fat. You could just put the meat in there and uh, put the oven on, and that's it. You know, so but when you fry things, you have to fry them in some type of fat. So, and that fat is um, going into whatever item you got in there. I feel like cooking is a lost art nowadays, especially like men weren't the traditional cookers, but now there's a lot more male chef. But I feel like a lot of women, no disrespect to the women, but a lot of women fell off in regards to cooking. You remember back in the days, the daughter would be in the kitchen with the mother cooking, and the mother would teach the woman basically how to cook for her husband. Once she got married, she instilled those skills into her. And also in school, there was, there was what's that called? class called baking class? I think home economics, where he taught the girls how to cook food and things of that nature. Why do you think it kind of sort of fell off to a certain extent? Well, I mean, I think time changed. Um, it's no longer the husband going out to work. I mean, it's both both partners now go out to work and they work long hours. So, uh, you know, the man is not the only one working 40 hours. The woman's working 40 hours. So um, now who, who, who's going to have the time to cook? I mean, to expect your wife your, your girlfriend or whoever to go out and work 40 hours and then come home and cook for you and you guys and you're just working 40 hours and then you put your feet up. Those days are really over. So now, you know, it's just, there's not enough time. People are just finding faster ways to eat. So there's not enough time in the kitchen, not enough time really learning. So the women are, are growing up and they're not in the kitchen anymore. And just because of time change. But home cooked food is way better than fast food. What you say? Yeah, home cooked food is way better. But do we really have the time to, to spend a few hours in the kitchen? You know, doing things from scratch. I mean, you could order stuff and or just buy it frozen and then put it in the microwave or the oven. It's the easy way to go. Or you could spend the the hours and prepping and and cooking. It takes a lot of time. I mean. Society change. I mean, we all have to work to, to make a living. It makes it very difficult to, to prepare a home cooked meal nowadays. I have to give a shout out to a couple of people who's watching. I see my boy, um, Eric Hervé um, G. Baptiste, on from Boston watching. And your cousin, Alexandria from Queens, is watching. I want to give a shout out to you. This is my man. He is the chef, he cooks the best food. I'm telling you, you know, I got to give you credit, you know. And, and I just have to say this the thing is that. One thing I love about the show is that we are about promoting our own people. We are uh, big on promoting black businesses. And I think it's a very beautiful thing that we can come together and promote everyone who um, allows them the opportunity to come to the show and, and, and like yourself. So we, we, we commend you of the work that you're doing and everything like that. Okay. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? So that's very, very key. At what age did you feel like you wanted to be a chef, that you felt like you wanted to cook and bake and everything else? I mean, um, I've, I've been cooking a very long time. Uh, growing up, I would always experiment and try to cook for myself. I mean, I wasn't always successful, but it, it really took a while for me to, to really decide this is what I want to do. Um, what, what is a while? Uh, I was definitely an adult by then, okay. in my 20s. Um, you know, when I was younger, cooking was just for fun. Um, but after years of really trying to figure out what to do, life is interesting in that way. Um, you know, it was my older brother who said, hey, look, there's a school in Manhattan. Um, you know, try to apply and maybe you should pursue cooking as a career because you really like doing it and it would be, it would work out for you. And I listened to him and, and went and, it, you know, from there it was just good things started really happening. Yeah, sometimes life makes a decision for you. Let me ask you a question. Would you consider yourself to be a spiritual man? Um, yeah, I would say yes. I mean, I, I grew up in the church, and, um, you know, I believe in God, and, uh, you know, I had some missteps, but I, I still truly believe there was a God, yes. How did your faith help you in regards to your work, as in when you're a chef and you're working and in, in your career? How did your faith help keep you rooted and planted? Um, just putting others first, you know, as, as a manager, as a leader, you always got to care about the people you manage and care about the people you cook for. I mean, um, cooking is a blessing. Um, just the church helped me kind of like put others first. Um, you know, it, it's, it's not always about yourself. And when you're taking care of customers, you got to be selfless. And I think um, cooking and serving other people is, is something that I got from, from the church and growing up. 
and just being willing to, to not think about myself only and put others first and, and you know, so. Can you watch, why, why do you think that it's, it's, it's very vital to being selfless? Um, and, and, and the food industry, it, it, it's important because um, we all have um, hard days in life, I mean, but it's important that we go out there and do a job. We're serving others. Our job is to serve others. And really, we can't serve and tell people, hey, look, I have a headache or I'm having a bad day. Go get your own fork and spoon. You just have to do what you're there to do no matter what really is going on in your own life. So we're there to make others feel better at that time and point, point in time. So um, serving is, is in the forefront uh, in this industry, being hospitable. Yeah. One of my homeboys used to be a server, and he was like, being a server, it humbles you in the sense that you're presenting something to someone, but the thing that you're giving to them is like you put a piece of yourself into it so that they could, I guess, righteously accept it. Do you feel that way? Um, yeah, I guess you could feel that way. I mean, um, you're looking to please others. I mean, if, if I could bring a smile to your face with just a piece of cake or, uh, you know, getting your order right or remembering your name, I mean, those type of things are might be very minute, but it could be important to that person at that time. You could be having such a bad day that you, you're ready to like jump off the bridge, but then somebody uh, says hi to you or remembers your name, and that changed your whole world. That's true. I want to give a shout-out to Judy. I see you, Judy. I want to give a shout-out to you 100%, my girl, and everything like that. Uh, mm -hmm. The term soul food, do you think, why do you think they call it soul food, you being a chef? Like, does it mean that when you cook, people, it's still so good in your stomach, you're like, mm, 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 like, you feel it in your soul? Is it, is it like they say that food is the gateway to someone's heart, to their stomach, like what they say about men? Do you um, that? It could be. There's a lot of things with it. I mean, I, I, what I think is soul food is just that you, you could picture your grandmother, your mother in the kitchen cooking, bringing the whole family together. And um, everything that's happening around the kitchen and, and that environment, and you're trying to taste something, that people are over, and then you set the table, and the whole family sits and eats together, and the food is good. I think that, you know, to me, when I think about soul food, I think about, you know, collard greens and, and chicken and, you know, people eating together. That's real. I also just want to just ask, we're going to go right back to you, but I wanted to ask, just to switch topics basically, I wanted to ask you, what did you feel about what Trump said Saturday um, with the NFL players who decided that they want to um, go against white supremacy and his comments? How do you feel about everything that's been going on for the past two, three days and everything? I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. What was his exact quote? I forget. Well, he called, um, excuse my expression, he called um, the, the people who support white supremacy nice people, and he called the people, like the, 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 the NFL players who are against white supremacy taking a knee, he called them bitches. Sons of bitches. Sons of bitches, yes. He basically yes. said that they should be fired. They right? should be fired, yeah. If they, if they don't really take the president's allegiance. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, like, how do you feel about that? Well, I mean, I. You know, first of all, I think the president just should focus on all the world issues that we're dealing with, and um, North Korea should be, you know, on his plate. He shouldn't worry about, you know, what the NFL players are really doing. I mean, it's a peaceful protest, and first of all, we have freedom of speech in this country, and I think, um, you know, the president thinks this is uh, his country. His country, and he yeah, he, he, yeah, I think he feels like he's a dictator, and he should control what people say and their actions, and plus he, 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 realized, he really shows us that he's a real sensitive person, that he takes every little thing to the heart. You know, if you say hi to him wrong, he's gonna tweet that you're a bad person or tweet something, so he's an interesting man. I mean, um, I think he needs to really focus on, on the task at hand and, and try to make this country great. Um, you know, um, I think it, it's important that people really deeply think about his comments. He's calling um, these um, grown men sons of... Uh, bitches. Yeah, and uh, so imagine how the, the mothers feel. And, um, you know, imagine if you have a, a daughter. I mean, the things that are really going on needs to change. I mean, police officers need to so really stop shooting to kill. I mean, I think um, the whole training has to change. There's a lot going on, and I think it, it goes beyond... Um, 
what the players are trying to do. Really, they, they, they're really just trying to make people aware of all the struggles that we go through. I mean, we dress a certain way, we'll get pulled over or talked to, and, you know, the gun is already cocked. When the cop pulls you over, they're ready to shoot, even if you tell them, look, I got a legal weapon, I'm not telling you I'm going to pull it out. But all you could hear is shots fired. I mean, it, it's very interesting um, what we're really going through in this society and what's really going on. I mean, for, for um, young black men to be handcuffed and then beat down, I mean, it, it's really gruesome. That's right. Yeah, man. Um, I was watching the highlights from Sunday night, well, Sunday football. I actually don't watch football anymore. I haven't watched it in a while. Probably the last time I watched it was a Super Bowl, but I watched half of it. Um, I guess that's my form of protest. But I can say that a lot of football players stood together in solidarity, and they stood firm. Like, before last year, it was just Kaepernick and a few, but now it seems like Trump forces people to acknowledge the issues in America, which means, like, for a while, they said, okay, how can America be racist? You got a black president, but we knew America was racist. But now it's like it's blatant in your face where you really can't ignore it. And the people that were, like, sitting down and they didn't want to say much, like, they're forced to stand up. It's like one of the NFL players said, he said, I got a daughter, my daughter's going to watch this, she's going to ask me why, why, why I didn't do anything, daddy. So he's like, he had to stand up, and he cried on TV when he said that. I think Trump focused on everything but what's important, as in like the issues with North Korea. He's taking it as a game, like he's talking mess in North Korea, saying basically like, he thinks this is a game, this is not a game. Like you blatantly disrespecting our country, that's an act of war. And he, to him, he thinks that he's still on TV, he thinks he's still on reality TV, and that it's all a joke and it's all a game, but it's not. This is people's lives that you're talking about, especially when you say that you will uh, uh, blow North Korea off the map and you will obliterate them. As much little respect as you have for them, there's 24 million people living over there. And that's 24 different lives and souls that God created. And you're taking it like it's a joke and you're like, okay, whatever. Like, I feel like someone needs to put a stop to him. I feel like if we, the people, if this is our country and we have a responsibility and we have a constitution to uphold, I feel like someone should put a stop to this. That's real. That's real. You guys said it well put. I, I wanted to go back to you. I wanted to ask you, um, what makes us what makes a successful chef, and what makes a bad chef? Hmm, that's that's a tough question. It's a tough question. Yeah, but that, you know, I'm a, I could attempt to answer it. Um, a bad chef is a chef that's willing to take risks to not use fresh items to really, um, you know, really just try to put something together with no thought. I mean, um, you know, to not be sanitary, to, to, to not, like, um, make sure the environment that he's preparing the food or she's preparing the food is clean. Um, make sure that you follow certain steps and rules. Um, you know, a, a successful chef is a chef that really cares about what they're doing and care about producing great meals and use the best ingredients and make sure everything is stored properly and um, no cross contamination, the knives are clean, they're not wiping their aprons and then touching your food, touching raw meat and touching your food. I mean, um, to go in a restaurant, to go in an establishment to eat, it takes a lot of trust and um, us being back there as chefs, we know that people trust us, that's why they're there. So. It's up to us to really uphold that and make sure that we, we do the right thing by the customer. So we, we make sure that we wash our hands when we come out the restroom. We make sure that we clean the cutting board. Yeah, there's states that watch, the government pays attention to that, but they're not there every day. So the day that inspections come in, you're going to clean and, and make sure that you follow the rules. The day that they step out, you go right back to your regular unsanitary routines. I mean... Um, Safety's got to come first. Um, food safety, people could get sick from food, bacteria. Um, we're dealing with people's lives. I think it's important. So a successful chef is a chef that, that pays attention to the details and makes sure that they truly care for their customers. What are the three top chefs right now that people look up to? Like, like across America? Um, well, 
It depends. I mean, there, there's a few um, famous chefs. Um, kind of put me on the spot there. Okay, my bad, bro. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we do out here, fortunately. Um, Unfortunately. I mean... Oh, oh, what's your favorite? Like, your, your favorite top three chefs that you like? You know, I, I don't really have a top three chef that okay. I like. Um, you know, I don't, I don't really follow chefs. Um, I kind of read about them a little bit, but I, I really, I, you could call this selfish. I'm, I'm focused on, on me and how I could get better in, in the game. That's what's saying. Um, you know, um, there's, there's a few chefs. Out so there. there, there's a game. It's like, like the rap game. There's like a, a chef game too, right? A like cool nice. Yeah, I mean, it could be like that, but a lot of it is. Um, there's a lot of people with more opportunity. I, I, I won't call somebody, you know not nice because they haven't had the same opportunities. And what, what, what do you mean opportunity, like the fun opportunity for me in regards to like what? All right, you, you could have somebody that wants to be a great chef, but they don't really have the financial backing to make it happen. And then you could have somebody that is an okay chef, but they have all the financial backing and they, they could take their career and really sort, you know, but um, the one without the financial backing could really struggle to really make it out. Oh yeah. Yeah. So uh, you know, does culinary school expensive? Um, culinary school is really, really expensive. Um, you know, it takes a lot of grants and scholarships to really get through. Wow. And then once once you're done, you gotta pay a lot of that back, and it's a struggle because um, it, it's a hard game. It's hard. I mean, you, you're working long hours for little money, mm-hmm. so it takes a while to really build and, and and grow from it. I mean, some people struggle to the point where they give up. Wow. Is it true that when you cook something with love, it tastes different from when you just cook it regularly? Is there any truth behind that statement? I think if you do anything in vain, I think um, that's where the problem lies. I, I think if you care for the people you're preparing the meal for and you care about what you're doing, I think the food will definitely be good. Oh, okay, okay. In your restaurant, right, where you work at, what's the most requested meal that people request the most when you go to your restaurant? Um, right now I'm not at a restaurant, okay. so I, I work. So, so what you working before? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, it varies. I mean, it varies. The rest is like what? Um, so let, let's say if, um, you know, people like sandwiches, I mean, uh, meat sandwiches, uh, it varies. I mean, I work in a lot of different establishments and, uh, really varies. I mean, you, you can't really determine what people are going to want. Yeah, you yeah. know, so... Um, but it depends on the restaurant, right? So, not to be modest, what kind of establishment have you worked on? You worked at? Well, um... Don't be modest. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you know, I, I got an opportunity to, to um, be executive chef at the Red Devon um, for, you know, about nine months. Um, what's, it, what's the Red Devon? Um, that's upstate New York. It was a, a bakery... Um, cafe and a restaurant bar. Okay. Um, and then, you know, I, uh, I went into, um, you know, I wanted to make more money, so I felt like, you know, cooking at a restaurant would be very difficult to, to make a living. So then I got an opportunity to, to work in um, hospital settings. Okay. So, um, like, like what? Like what kind of hospital? Um, I, I worked at uh, Yale for a few years. I, I started okay. out at St. Raphael, um, and then it was purchased by Yale New Haven Hospital. And then, um, you know, I uh, was a sous chef in there, and then eventually became an executive chef at the York Street campus, and, um, you know, worked there for about a few years. That's what's up. Okay, okay. So this is pretty much you as a boss, basically. Um, yeah, you could say that. Um, we. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I had to get you to say that. You know? <laughs> well, it was a, a you know a thousand bed hospital. We were pumping about twenty six hundred meals a day. Um, you know, I had uh, it's almost like three restaurants where you have three different sets of lines where you're cooking um, for the hospital nonstop, like a hotel style cooking. So the people were calling the call service and ordering. And then it would come through the, the ticket machines like it would in a restaurant. And then the staff would have to prepare it. And then, you know, it's a hospital. People have a lot of complaints. So then you have to do a lot of troubleshootings and going up to patients' room to sit and talk and try to, you know, That's what's up. Things. I want to give a shout-out to Stefan. I see you watching. 
Salute to you, my brother. Okay, if there's any questions, any comments, let us know. Mm-hmm. Growing up, right? And what neighborhood did you grow up in? Uh, I grew up in um, New Jersey, um, High Park. Um, my parents, we, we moved a lot. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, I grew up in, um, in the hooded areas, and then I also grew up in the suburbs. And what would you say would be the main difference between the hood and the suburbs? Um, I would say in the, in the hood, people do things out in the open, and then in the suburbs, everything is done in the woods. <laughs> <laughs> break that down for me. You've got to break that down a little bit more. Uh, but it, it, it's the same, you know, people are people, so you, you're going to run into the same situations, but it's just different people. It's just cleaned up differently, you say. Yeah, so, you know, instead of, like, you know, partying in the house where people could see, they would set the parties in the woods. Um, they would bring out the, the same type of alcohol, the same type of drugs, and they would just do it away from where people could really see. So how do you think your childhood influenced you as an adult right now? Um, you know, I had an opportunity to try and do a lot of different things. I partied uh, a lot and um, got that out of my system, and I think right now... <laughs> You know, I think right now that helps me. I'm a little bit more settled. Um, you know, there's certain things that I, I don't get into anymore because, you know, I did it in the past and I know how it affects people in a negative way. So I think, um, I think, you know, most people have to, like, go through a lot of things. I think college is important, um, not only for the education, but for you to kind of live those young years where you get to, to, to see these things and party and, and get it out of your system because when you're an adult and you have a lot of responsibilities, it, it just really doesn't really make sense in your life to be an adult and have children and still try to live that life. You, you gotta, you really gotta, you know. Some people call it the whole phase, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, you, gotta, you gotta get through that. You can't really... You know. <laughs> You know, so, it's so, and it's important. You try to tell people, yeah, go to school so you can get an education. That's very important. But also go to school so you can learn and experience some things that you, you need out your life by the time you're 30. That's right. That's not pay for the real world. That's um, nice. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and you don't have to, to, to get involved in those things. Just seeing them. Because say, wow, this is something I don't want to do. Watching somebody bench drink or do certain type of drugs is might not be something you involve or have to do, but at least you witnessed it and you already know. And then now when you have kids, you could help them, you know? So what was something that you went through in college or learned from in college or that you experienced while in college that helped you as an adult? Hmm. You know, just building relationships, I think, um, in college is something that, um, learning to build networks, I think um, that, that really helps me as an adult. Um, you know, uh, yes, it's good to have friends, but it's, it's the type of friends you build is friends that are going to be there for you in the future. It's almost like a network where you know you can call on this chef to help you execute something that, um, you know, do this function. So. It, it, you build these life relationships with people and you get to experience their world and they experience your world and you experience a lot of their culture and you guys build a relationship. I think um, in my college years, I, I had really had the opportunity to be around some good people and travel and, and do a lot of things that I, I, I wouldn't do growing up uh, as a young Haitian man. Um, so, you know, going uh, to wine, tours in California, just tasting wine, eating food, and, um, you know, a lot of these things, um, those opportunities. Awesome. Those are Boston. I didn't even know you were Haitian. He's Haitian, yeah. 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 He's He's Haitian. Haitian. Ask your question, right? Yes. You know you're Haitian. <laughs> being, being Haitian, Ooh. right, and growing up, how did your parents feel about you becoming a chef? Because I know most Haitians, they want, they're, they're trying to become a nurse or a doctor or something like that, like, well, how was that? I think my, my parents realized that I, I wasn't the smartest one in the room, so in, in the sense of like book educated where they knew I, I wouldn't become a doctor. So I think they just wanted me to be successful. I, I think, um, plus they knew I could cook. I cooked for them and they, they, they saw the passion that I, I put forward when I cooked. So I, 
I think they were very supportive of me becoming a chef, and um, you know they're still very proud of me to this day. That's good, man. You say you grew up in the church, right? What did you learn while in the church growing up, and do you still keep your faith to this day, or what? Um, I mean, uh, I tell you, I I put myself in a lot of bad situations, um, but um, yeah, I, I still put my faith first. Um, growing up in the church. Uh, once again, you build these long relationships, you meet great people, I mean, um, but one thing I did learn is that parents make mistakes and people that are religious make mistakes. I think growing up when you're in the church, you think everyone's perfect and I think um, over time you start to see through that and uh, that creates a conflict in your life really. It's, man, uh, these people are supposed to be perfect and they're not. How do I deal with that? And I think, um, you know, growing up and growing and, and what I've really learned is it's okay for people to, to make mistakes and not be perfect. That's real. Um, I want to basically ask you this. With the job, so what kind of shit did you just, where are you going to be working at and what position are you going to be taking and what's your focal point when it comes to this new position and everything? Um, uh, well, this new position is uh, I'm going to be the general manager. Um, this, uh, this is Carlos uh, Bakery. How long has it been in, is it in existence? I, I think uh, I read about it a little bit, 1910, but um, it, it's... Oh, in, in Times Square? Um, no, no, I'm not sure how long that um, okay. location's been up, but um, it, it's uh, it's the Cake Boss, um, so it's it's his uh, company, um, and... Um, so you bake, also? Well, I, I do both. I cook and I bake. Yeah. Um, I, I could cook do, good too, boy. I could do whatever. I could make snacks from scratch. I could basically do a lot of different things. Like what? Talk, be specific. Like, okay, when it comes to like Haitian food, like main three dishes that you would cook for us right now in your mind, in your, in your mind right now. I need to cook. I need to cook. Period. So. All right. I mean, easy. I mean, Haitian. We like um, we like our cob. We like our turkey. Um, um, de cola, um, okay. some some red snapper. Okay. Um, you know, um, banana pizza. Okay. You know, and uh, we, <laughs> we we love our pate, so I I I I would do some pate right here for you guys from scratch. Um, you know, and just um, make it happen. Not only pate cordy, the real pate. Okay. Right? The puff pastry pate, I do all of that. Okay, 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 okay. How is your faith nowadays? Like, what's your connection with God like nowadays? Um, it, 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 it's getting better. It's a journey, um, you know, and there's a lot of things that happen behind the scenes um, we, we don't know about. Um, I think as human, as people, um, we get depressed a lot. We have no patience. We want things to happen now. I think um, there's a plan for us, and um, we just got to have faith. Um, you know, there's a lot of struggles in this life. People go through a lot of things, and every day, you know, it's easy to think about jumping off that, that bridge, man, but um, uh, there's a plan for you, no matter how low you are in this life right now, no matter how, you know, everything you do, your tires popped in the street, your car is broken, you get in an accident, um, you know, all sorts of things. You know, you, you step out of your car to go to the store, you then put it in park, it's heading toward a bus, and you run and jump in, and get your legs cut up so you can stop your car and turn it. There's a lot of things that happen in this life, um, and I think um, with patience and faith, um, we get through it. I mean, it, it seems harder than, it, it, it's, it seems really hard, but it, things look really bad. And, but really, I don't think it's that bad if you really have faith. I think there's a plan um, for people um, more so than they know, um, you know, because it, it, if, you, if you're on that last line and you think, the best thing for you to do is give up. Don't do it because there's somebody out there that that needs you. Was the last time? Was the last time you made some 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 banana pudding and bread pudding? Was the last time you made some of that? Um, so I'm, I'm a big fan of that. Really? Yes. Um, uh, it, it's been a while. It's okay. Been a okay. While. But but you also know how to make devil eggs from scratch as well too. Oh yeah, that's simple stuff. I mean, that's okay. kids kids play, man. Yes, I mean, yes. devil's egg. You just uh, boil the egg and you take the yolk and you season it and put it back in the egg. Okay, okay. So that's something very simple. What do you, what do you usually season it with? I wanted to know what you uh, usually season it with. Salt, pepper, paprika. Okay, okay. It's a okay. Hungarian dish, so. Okay. So yeah. sasson? <laughs> um, well, if, you, if you're cooking it for our culture, yeah, you could add some sasson. Mm -hmm. You know, some adobo. 
Okay. Yeah, we, we love our adobo. Wow. Back to what you were saying about how, when you feel like you're on the edge, and you feel like you're close to giving up, um, don't give up, just keep pushing through. It sounds like you went through something like that in your life where you went through a difficulty and you had to push through. Uh, life, life is difficult. You know, it's, it's, it's really hard. And um, constantly you have to battle through, through your own head. So, um, yeah, I mean, I've, I've been through a lot. I, I go through a lot just mentally and I think in my own head. I mean, sometimes I think I'm my worst enemy. Yes. Sitting there thinking about things and, and you know, really trying to... I don't mind if the devil's playground. Do you feel like I should? Uh, yeah. Yeah. You ever heard the expression... I sit alone in the four corner room, ready to go bananas, not looking at hammers. I think that was Beanie Siegel when you said, I could feel it in the air. I think TJ says this the most. He said, men is not meant to be alone. That's why sometimes you could torture a man, you could beat a man, you could put a man through anything. Once you pull him in solitary confinement, he's ready to go crazy. That's basically why they put you in jail. Like they said, they put you in a cell. A cell drains your energy like a battery is door a cell. And then because it's a cell, it drains your battery. And when you get arrested, it's either for um, a misdemeanor, assault, or a battery. So basically it drains your energy because you're like the energy form. So sometimes when you're in a room by yourself and it's just you, and your thoughts is bouncing off the walls and it's coming back at you and it's hitting you, it's hitting you, it's hitting you. Sometimes that could take away your energy. Wow. Do you feel like that ever occurred to you? Um, yeah, that's, that's, I mean, sometimes, you know, you, you, you could be in a room full of people and you're alone in your mind. I think a lot of times we get really consumed in our own world and it doesn't matter how many people we have around us and what they're telling us that's positive or negative. We're just so consumed in our problems and our issues that we feel alone. We feel like we're the only one that can battle this. We're the only one that knows what I, the individual, is going through. So, um, you know, being alone doesn't mean uh, being in a room by yourself. You could really be in a group of people around a lot of people, but so you were alone, yeah. I, I want to give a shout out to two people. I want to give a shout out to Ash Monet, your peoples, and Naomi. Any questions in regards to my man who's a chef, let him know. I, I'm going to say something, God. Um, Lady Gaga recently put out a documentary, a memoir, where she's like how Every time she's on stage, she basically puts on a front because she's like physically sick. She goes through a lot mentally and physically. She was like, one of the things that affected her most mentally is that she could be in a room with thousands of people screaming out her name, trying to touch her and everything. When she goes home, she's in a room alone and there's no one there to see her hurting. And there's a lot of people that go through things like that too. That's true. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really hard for us to reveal our pain to others. I mean, it takes a lot because, you know, some of these things we think we could go through it alone, but it's good to have a partner in this world. It's good to have somebody where you can count on them, where you could spill your guts out and it's not the whole world listening, it's just that one person. I think part of the issue is that we feel like if we tell one person something, they're going to run and tell something. And we don't want to ask... People, we don't want to look weak. I think um, we fear weakness. Yeah. So I wanted to ask you this to add um, for food. So banana bread pudding. Explain how do I make bread pudding and banana pudding? Talk to me. Because <laughs> I like food. You know, you're a chef. So, so you, pick, you pick bread pudding. I mean, I like both. I know somebody in Jersey, she knows how to make both. Like and correlation with this at the same time. I just want to know. Oh, you know, I want better banana pudding. How do you make banana pudding? Um, I guess you would start out, you basically make a custard. So you, you start out making a creme on base. What's a creme on base? that? It's just um, eggs that you really cook with cream. Okay. Sugar, egg yolks. Okay. You know, and then you, you cook it on low heat. Okay. Basically a double band marie, and then you just Ooh. make it thick. Okay, okay. All right, and then um, you add the bananas, basically you thicken that up. Okay, okay, and how long does that take you to, to semester? Um, it takes a while because you, you got to um, temper your eggs and your cream and egg. Okay. And, um, you use the same base to make ice cream and you would use that same base to make your, your bread pudding. And then you would 
soak it and then put put it in the oven and, and bake it. Okay, okay. All right, that's what's up. Amazing. Mm. Got me thinking. And um, wow. He likes simple things. I, mean, I like no, some, that's fine. That's fine. I, I mean, I like I like banana pudding. I like bread pudding. Um, yeah, man. I just love good, 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 good food. You know what I'm saying? So I like to eat. You know, I like to eat. So yeah. Do you think food is is a way to bring people together? Because I know, like during Thanksgiving, that's a basically a feast, a meal, and everybody comes together, families and friends, and everyone gathers around. Do you feel like food plays an important part in bringing people together? Yeah, food definitely helps and brings people together. It's usually the key and the focus of, of a function. So if you're having a party at home, everybody brings food, or you're cooking, I mean, you know. Even at church, as long as you got food. <laughs> well, That's yeah, true. Church, I mean, especially at church after, you know, the, Seventh-day Adventist Church, they, they last long, so yeah. it's important to have some food um, waiting, but uh, food brings a lot of people together, you know, um, you know, at the end, when church is over, everybody goes to the dining room to eat. That's and true. People um, serving, I mean, it doesn't matter what position you hold, um, you, you start to serve, it doesn't matter part you have parked outside, you're willing to serve others, no one is really judging, and you're running around and doing whatever it takes make sure that we all get fed and eat. Come on now. Yeah, food was a big issue in my church to the point where they had to go to the committee and ask for a budget every week so they can have food to feed everybody. <laughs> so That's they real. Got, so they got a set budget for them to get food to feed everyone every week. Also, there's a director of the cafeteria, like <laughs> someone in charge. I, I, was, I was in charge at one point of the um, Cafeteria, yeah. at, um, and, and, you, and you ripped it. You know, you ripped it. Uh, well, I did my best. Now I mean, you did, you did your thing. Don't lie. I know you're modest. I wish church was there. Mid, Mid Hudson. Hudson. Mid Hudson. Yeah. Oh, so one cooks great. One thing though that that was challenging was was trying to get the older people and the young kids to eat first. Um, that was a challenge. Um, uh, the able bodies would always come and kind of like try to strong arm everything, but. You know, the goal would be to serve, <laughs> serve those that can't really stand long and then serve the kids because they were waiting so long and they're hungry. They have little stomachs. I mean, the adults, I feel like they should be able to wait, but nah, that wasn't, I mean, nah, nah, it's the, uh, it's it's like, move. It's it, elders it, first. It, 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 yeah, I mean, it, yes. it, elders, I mean, elders shouldn't even be first. I, you know, I respect elders. I respect all of that, but I, I feel the true nature would be to feed the young children and, um, and the elderly first. Yeah. Yeah. So, quick question: Do do you want to own your um, your own restaurant and a couple of franchises eventually? Um, yeah, I mean, I got a few projects that um, I worked on and a few projects that I'm continuing. It's a long term uh, plan. Um, you know, I do have uh, a little uh, business that's called T Mush, and uh, the focus of that business would be. Uh, it's a bake shop, bakery, so um, we would do uh, savory uh, patties, so it would be like the mm. Haitian pate and also the Jamaican beef patty. Everything, I can't wait. Everything would be done from scratch, um, food, food, you know, food. Uh, working on the financial part of it, but, you know, I, I um, you know, I, I made the products, I uh, prototyped them, I worked on the recipes, um, put them together, I made several Haitian patties, empanadas, and um, the Jamaican beef patty and, um, you know, jerk chicken, curry chicken. Um, so it would just be, the focus would just be empanadas, Haitian patties, and, and beef patties. And, um, you know, look for it. It's coming out. Dimanche. Um, it might take a few years. Dimanche translates to Sunday. Eventually we'll, we'll get this thing well, going. Why, why would you call it Dimanche, Sunday? Um, it, so... When, when I went, I was really motivated to get this business started, so I, I jumped the gun and um, went out there and found a company that could help me, um, you know, uh, put the business together, make it legal. And um, so I started reaching out to my family members and kind of tried to help them, help me brainstorm a name um, for the business. And um, after a lot of different um, options, um, I decided to go with Dimanche. Sunday is simple. People won't know it if you're not Haitian or French. You won't know what that means. So it would be intriguing to you to say, "Well, Dimanche, let me go check this place out, see what it's all about." <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. So I, I, I'm really looking forward to working with you soon in regards to 
promoting your business, I think that's very important that we do that because we need, you know, there's a lot of events that goes to church like weddings, um, funerals, baby dedication, birthdays, different functions that we need your services and stuff like that. So I'm looking forward for that tremendously. Yeah, and um, uh, Sanders and I were talking um, for a few weeks now, and our goal is to, um, you know, start doing some, some cooking demonstrations live so people could see some of the things that we can do. Um, yes. You know, prepare anything. I mean, uh, you guys could ask us to make something that you want to try, and we would definitely prepare it there for you um, live. Um, you know, and then I'll come up with a few menu items that I think are interesting, and then, um, you know, we would prepare the meal, and then we would sit and eat. Definitely, definitely, because it's, it's, it's about that time, because we have somebody who really wants to um, support the Real Word Ministries, somebody who really wants to support um, 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 the Winter Circle Church, so we need that tremendously and everything like that. So with that being said, I know we have a couple announcements before we wrap up. Um, What's that? Uh, uh, well, <laughs> I'll go first. Well, the thing is that first and foremost, we're asking that um, each and every one of you guys who are watching, we definitely need your financial support because we're going to be doing a lot of big things in the community. We're going to be having a MetroCard drive next month, the end of um, the end of the last side of the month. We're giving out free MetroCards to people in the community. November, we're going to be giving out free turkeys. December, we're going to be giving out free um, free free toys. And generally, we're going to have uh, free code. So we want your contribution. We want your participation. Without you, we cannot do these things. But somebody's asked a question. I'm so sorry. Want to say something? Oh, God. No, go ahead. Answer. Now, Naomi asks, hi, everyone. What do you think will help more? What do you think will help more men to see the kitchen as a gender mutual place? There is still a traditional view of the kitchen being a woman's place. And also, what would... Um, and what would is, is incentivize more men to learn how to cook? Sh should I ask questions like, no, not no, okay, this is the first question. She says, okay, what do you think will help more men to see the kitchen as a gender mutual place? I think if people go in the kitchen together, I mean, if you're going to cook a meal instead of having the woman go and prepare it, I'll cut the onions, you cut the peppers, we work together. To Facts. Work together. Facts. You know, so um, it, it's never you go do this and then I'll sit out like a king and watch football. Facts. But it should be like, we're going to, we both need to eat. So I'm going to help this process by just helping out. If I can't cut or do anything, I'll wash the plates, I'll wash the vegetables, I'll do what I can, I'll support whatever it takes. I think if people approach it where it's like, we both need to eat. We need to support each other. So if we do it together. I think that'll get, you know, more people in the kitchen. I mean, it, it, it's got to be something that's fun. I mean, sometimes you could go in the kitchen if the woman's cooking and you want to touch this, and she's like, no, 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 no. But if she's open to you helping and and participating and making a few mistakes, and it's okay, I think you know more people. Would Kind of, there's, kind of the fact that there, there, there's some women, like, you know, um, I've been around the block, I know that there's some women, like especially when a man, he, he does different chores and stuff like that in regards to um, laundry or um, washing dishes, um, brooming, cleaning up. There's some women, their kitchen is their sanctuary. You do everything else as a man, but don't touch my kitchen. Right? Which is okay, you know what I'm saying, it's understandable. And I wanted to basically, uh, she asked too, um, what would um, incentivize more men to learn how to cook? What would be an incentive for more men to want to cook? I would say that if you learn how to cook as a man, the incentive is that you'll save money. You Facts. You to go out and spend a lot of money all the time. True. But the incentive is that you would attract more women. You'd be like, oh, come over, I'll cook you something make a nice candlelight dinner, pour a little bit of wine, and you know. Come on now. Smooth R&B and some jazz, and we get to know each other. That's true. So, you know, it's, it's what you make it. Remember that movie with the dogs? Um, I don't know what it was called. That cartoon? Yeah, the cartoon with um, the two dogs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah that dog, what the other dog go by going behind the restaurant. Yes. And 
spaghetti and meatballs. That's what I'm telling you. They shared that lip lap spaghetti and then they kissed. Yes. Simple stuff. I mean, saving money, I mean, it's deep. And then just being able to build a relationship off of that. I mean, you could you could make a woman happy with a good meal. I think you're good. That's good. Um, you know, you want to keep your woman at home, cook good. Okay. You know. That's what's up. Know your way around the kitchen. Come on now. Come on now. Um, anything else before we go, Ricard? Um, I want to shout out my brother. Shout out to AJ. Um, you can see him. You, you can find him on SoundCloud and that Piff. That's AJ Rob. He just dropped a new mixtape um, called, I think, the, it's called Noir. Yes. N-O-I-R, which means black in French. But it's a good, it's a dope mixtape, dope songs. So I want to shout out to the Jordan River SDA Church. Shout out to everyone that's been supporting. Shout out to our chef here for coming on the show. Shout yes. Shout out to Brother Sanders. Shout out to all the viewers. Shout out to everybody. I want everybody to go and add themselves to the Real, the real Word group page on Facebook. We're going to yes. start shooting from there. Shout out to the Brick. We got things working on with the Brick. Shout out to them. And we're just going to keep moving. You know, we're going to keep moving forward. Um, if you want to come on the show, if you want to be a guest, if you want to come on here and promote something, promote black business or whatever it is you like to promote, conversations that you like to have, we are here to share a platform with everybody, you know? That's right. We don't mind putting people on. We don't mind helping out the community. Next thing coming up is a toy drive and a clothing drive, a coat drive. We already got donations. People that's donated already toys and coats. If you want to donate physical stuff, you could contact me or Brother Sanders through Facebook. Um, if you want to donate money, you can donate through our GoFundMe, GoFundMe backslash the real word, or you can donate through our PayPal, um, PayPal backslash the real word. We'll put the link in the description, and we're going to have t-shirts and other merchandise coming soon, and we thank you all for joining us, and that's about it for me. And salute to Ernst Pym, I mentioned that your, your brother's album is fire, so I'm really looking forward to hearing that. Let's support each other, man. Let's support our own, which is essential. Yeah, man. And shout out to Brooklyn. Shout out to God. Yes. Um, you want to close out with a prayer? Mr. Chef, I'll let you pray. Oh, no, no. no, no. <laughs> let's, let's stand Father God, we thank you once more again for your grace. We pray that you may cover us with your presence and your love. Lord, we thank you for what you've been doing through this show and for this show. Strengthen us and keep us. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. 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 So we'll see you next week. And thank you for tuning in, everybody. Good night. Good night. Thank you for having me on, guys. Of course.